So can you tell us how you got interested in clinical psychology? Sure. Um, I was doing mostly cognitive science for graduate work, and it had largely military applications. I wanted to see if we could help people um, with this same kind of work. So I transitioned from basic cognitive science to saying, how could we apply the tools of cognitive science to clinical populations? And that's sort of where I've been ever since in this translational world. Um, what's changed is realizing how much we have to do to actually make those translations practical. We can theoretically import things, but it's not that clinicians are going to use them unless we do more than just say, hey, there's an interesting insight here. So who are the most important influences on your career? I would say there have been a bunch, um, certainly William James, because in the 1800s, he was talking about the importance of emotions. Um, Freud was an important influence in that he was a neurologist who was saying that neurology has something to say to psychology. More modern times, Aaron Beck, of course, creating cognitive therapy, saying there is something to thoughts and feelings that might be important. And then approximately the work of John Teasdale, where he basically said not only might people think negatively, but that might spark negative feelings, which spark negative thoughts again, which creates a loop. And it's this going over and over negative things that I've been stuck on for the last 20 years or so. Um, most proximally, Rick Ingram and Colin McLeod have been really my constant inspirations because they started to say, how can we understand these loops? Are there cognitive science formulations we could pull from that um, allow us to understand why people think over and over negatively? And they looked at network formulations, which has been what I've been um, using and basically bringing neuroscience to. What started your interest in cognitive behavioral treatment? Well, I was looking for something that would address information processing very directly. That is to say, if we're if we have cognitive models saying that emotion results from negative thinking, what would we do about that? And CBT was tailor-made for it. So it really was, if I invented something, what would it look like? Oh, look, Aaron Beck did that in 1967. Let's just use that. The um, other reason I got really interested was because it was created without a whole lot of neuroscience behind it. And yet the neuroscience lay on on so direct. So CBT starts with the idea that thinking and feeling interact. And I had brain mechanisms of feeling, which we showed very early on, um, were disrupted and sustained in depression. And that the way you counteracted that was by bringing on brain mechanisms in the newer parts of the brain, prefrontal cortex, that seemed to inhibit areas like the amygdala, which had that sustained activity. So saying, oh yeah, we have brain mechanisms of thinking and feeling interacting. We can address the brain mechanisms of thinking and it affects the feeling mechanisms really lay on very nicely to the cognitive model. And so it's just something that I could work with in CBT and, and feel like I had something to say to clinicians that gave them more explanatory power without having to change the fundamentals of what they were doing. To the extent that I have important contributions, I'd say the first one is showing that mechanisms of sustained processing of negative emotion are detectable at the level of the brain. I can show you a negative word. I can show that your pupil dilation, which reflects cognitive load, is sustained in response to that. I can look at your amygdala and show you that its activity is sustained for 15 to 30 seconds in response to an emotional word presented just for a fraction of a second. When people see that, they say, oh, it's not me making stuff up. There are actual brain mechanisms that I can pay attention to. And they feel like their depression is 
less that they are less to blame for their depression because their brain is actually doing stuff. I think that's this work has led to some changes in how we treat people. We created an intervention that says if prefrontal control, if these cognitive mechanisms can inhibit amygdala activity, can we just shore up the cognitive mechanisms without having to work on the negative stuff so much? So we gave people cognitive training and that actually did decrease amygdala activity and it decreased rumination, which therapy alone didn't do. So this in addition to therapy was helpful. And that's led to, I think there are like 14 clinical trials on three continents now of this cognitive training, either alone or in addition to cognitive behavior therapy. Um, so I've been, I've been happy to see that happen. Again, we need to work harder to get this out of laboratories and into routine clinics. Um, another potential contribution, we've done a lot of work showing that the dream of personalized medicine could be true. If you let me scan your brain, I can tell you pretty much who's gonna to respond to cognitive behavior therapy. We also know that this isn't practical, people's brains are not gonna be scanned. So to get that into clinics, we have to do something else. We have to say what are proxies, what are good variables that might reflect brain scans. But even showing that, there, that it might be possible to personalize medicine this way, I think is a contribution that a lot of people are excited about because it means maybe you don't have to shove cognitive behavior therapy down everyone's throat if they look like they're not responding. Or the way I've been thinking of it a lot lately, suppose you don't look like a responder, is there something we could do that will turn you into a responder before we give you cognitive behavior therapy? Maybe like increasing prefrontal control before CBT, and we've just done a trial with that. Something that I'm really excited might be a contribution is the work we've been doing over the last two years has been saying CBT really concentrates a lot on what's above the neck and looking at the rest of the body and how the body plays into um, thinking and feeling might be really important. I think the people who talk about inflammation have had a story about this for a very long time. And I think as CBT people, we're just catching up so we've got some new auxiliary interventions that we think might add a lot to CBT that concentrate a lot on the rest of the body. So we've been showing, for example, that vibration um, placed on the chest or on the wrist might actually affect how calm you, so you perceive yourself as being and maybe your ability to regulate emotions. And that work has made it out of the lab into product already, even though the publications are still forthcoming. Wow, that's really interesting work that you guys are doing. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so how can we do a better job of disseminating CBT to clinicians? Yeah, I think this is the critical area because, again, so many of these insights have been coming up over the last 40 years in how to improve CBT, how to... Um, you know, address relevant brain mechanisms, and they haven't made it into clinics. We published a paper last year that showed that, that academics and patients and providers are using two very different vocabularies. And then industry is probably using yet a third vocabulary. So as a researcher, I can do all the work in the world to show that we can identify brain mechanisms and improve brain mechanisms, function, and stuff like that. No patient's going to say, yay, my amygdala is changing and go out and use my intervention. Rather, patients are talking about things like I want more days at work free, is pr free of presenteeism. How many information stu processing studies do you know that address presenteeism? Or how many brain studies do you know that are looking at something like that? So I think we've got to harmonize the vocabulary and the goals being used between patients and providers and both um, academia, where we're talking about mechanisms, and then also something like industry and the people who make stuff like the DSM, where patients don't care if they're diagnosed, they just want to feel better. Um, that level of harmony is something that's a future goal. Also, I think that so much of mechanistic work 
and work on basic science that underlies CBT does not yet account for implementation science. We're not saying, if I do this thing, how is some clinic going to use it practically? And that leads me to doing all sorts of studies with brain scans that don't necessarily make it out into clinics tomorrow. The discussions we've been having in the think tank, the um, moving neuroscience into the clinic think tank, that ABC thing, um, I'm so grateful they sponsored me to lead in 2019 and a lot at ABCT last year and which will continue to push at ABCT this year, have been talking about how building implementation science and building in dissemination science into basic research from the very beginning would make us do that work differently. If somebody has to use what you're doing, would you publish the same way? Would you add auxiliary measures? Would you, for example, choose to use consumer-grade technologies rather than the most expensive and potentially most accurate research-grade technologies to measure things that might help fig people figure out how they want to um, change what treatment they go into. I think there's a lot to do there, um, and there's a lot of discussions we have to have around that. Part of it is a lot of training we want to do with the next generation of scientists to say, what would it mean for you to be thinking about implementation scientists at the level, or science, at the level of your basic dissertation? So we've actually proposed that as an institute for ABCT as a pre-conference this year to take otherwise basic scientists who are just starting their dissertations or big projects and have a bunch of implementation scientists talk to them and say, here's how we might think about changing things. That'll be really cool to see. Thank you. <laughs> um, so what do you believe are the biggest challenges facing clinical science as a whole? Um, I think the vocabulary differences are some of the biggest challenges. You know, we have to be speaking the same language as our patients if we want our patients to care. And that's going to be hard, hard to publish. So, you know, actually figuring out what does it even mean to do that in our publications, in our presentations, is a challenge. Um, differences in priorities between what patients think are the priorities and academics think are the priorities are huge. I think that's going to be addressed at the level of grant mechanisms. That is, when you're going to apply for a grant, if you have patient stakeholders and provider stakeholders is saying, yeah, if you do this thing, I would actually care. I would use it. You should get a higher score, a better score on your grant for that. Um, and then making implementation a focus. Um, it doesn't mean giving implementable solutions as much as being on a pathway toward implementation in the work you're doing um, it is a challenge. What recent findings about, about sex pathology and mental health are likely to have the greatest impact on future research into practice? It's a really interesting question. I'm so glad you guys are asking that because it means how do we shape the field to actually have an impact. I would like to say that neuroscience is gonna be the thing that really propels us, um, especially realizing, for example, that brains are complicated and understanding brains gives us back doors into how to change our practice that maybe we would never have expected. Stuff like this extraceptive stimulation, how does the body interact with brains I think it could be huge. Um, I think that recent findings from people like Maya Tamir are radically changing how we understand emotion, cognition, and interactions. What Maya Tamir has showed us is that a lot of the, what we think of as emotion effects on thinking and thinking effects on emotion are based on the meaning making that we do. So if you tell people, yeah, you're, you're angry, you can use your anger to perform better, the angry people do better on cognitive tasks. If you tell people, yeah, you're angry, and angry distracts you from being able to actually have good cognitive performance, they perform worse on cognitive tasks. Um, so understanding where meaning making fits in and people's stories fit in is, I think, going to be huge. And I think that's very consistent with Gen Z. 
who does not want us to tell them how their brains work and to tell them what the meaning of their symptom is, is but actually for us to ask. So I think our science is saying we have to ask people more and we have to speak to them in a language that they actually care about. Um, another research area that's gonna have a huge impact, I think, is mindfulness. Because mindfulness has, perva has pervaded our discipline. And what we're seeing is for some people, maybe disputing their cognitions is really good and exactly what they need to do. And maybe for other people, actually listening and being present with their emotions and sitting is exactly what they need to do. And I think that these two areas starting to be reconciled and starting to see how one would affect the other is gonna propel our science really far forward because again, part of it's telling and part of it's listening and these two have to meet somewhere. So how do you see CBT evolving in the next 10 years? Um, I think personalization, neuroscience and implementation are where it's evolving. Personalization, maybe CBT is a sometimes thing rather than your go-to always. Or if you look like a non-responder, what would we do for you to make you more like a responder? And going to pre-treatments and going to, here's how we build you up so that we're capitalizing on strengths you have. Um, so second, neuroscience, I think we're gonna have to be listening to stuff that brain science is telling us. Reedy DeRate published a great article recently. Michelle Prask's work is speaking to this saying, we would actually do our behavior therapies differently if we looked at how brains learn. Maybe you expose somebody for a little bit and then wait a while before doing your big exposure to them. Maybe the pharmacologies we use based on neuroscience are things that we should um, care about, like giving people propranolol during exposure therapies. And then implementation science. If we're thinking right from the beginning, how do I use this? Our research is going to change, and that's going to change how we do our CBT. I can't tell you how it's going to change CBT because I don't think we're doing it enough yet, but I think it has a big potential. So what changes would you want to see in graduate teaching and training in psychology? It's a really good question. Um, I think the big change I would like to see is making sure people get not only education in neuroscience, but also in implementation science, and then having actual coursework, having actual um, education in what it means to combine them. So yes, here's brain theory. What does that mean for how you do CBT? And having that be part of our graduate training, because I think right now our graduates are taught things that they can do in the clinic, and then they're taught neuroscience because they're told it's important, what one has to do with the other isn't yet making it into our training programs in as strong a way as maybe it could. What areas or issues do you feel CBT needs to address more in the future? I think you sort of touched on it, but if you have any other. Yeah, and again, making it so personalization um, actually has the, the ability to be implemented. So it's not so expensive. What are low cost ways we can personalize? Who needs more assessments? So maybe you could start by just looking at demographics. Maybe some people you need to give the BDI to and some people's brains you need to scan to figure out whether they need CBT or what kind of CBT you need to do. And then again, this making the insights we have from neuroscience implementation and shovel ready is I think something we really need to address. Question, um, how has membership in ABT impacted your career? So much. <laughs> ABT is and has been my professional home since I was in graduate school over 20 years ago. Um, ABC has constantly supported my innovation. I bring something that's new, weird, or different to ABCT, and people are like, yeah, let's think about how that might work. It's kept me in touch with what clinicians care about even as I move more and more into research and the, the esoteric research, I, I come to ABCT and talk about it and clinicians are saying, yeah, I would care about that or no, I wouldn't bother. It was a long time I was saying, yeah, we should really be pushing for brain scans before treatment. 
and I could, would come to ABCT and people would say, yeah, that seems important, but I can't see a rural clinician in Florida having access to that. What else can you give me? And so um, finally, ABCT has really given me hope that clinical audiences will care about what's going on in research labs if we can work to translate it. And so this think tank that they sponsored me to be part of was a really big deal because it means ABCT's leadership cares about clinical translation and cares about what would we do differently. The questions you're asking make me think about what we can do differently and let me try and give a sense for that. And I think ABCT is what's going to propel the field to really change. And I want to be so enthusiastic about being part of that.